to a very special edition of Merit Rounds. This is a Sibley lecture made possible by an endowment from the Sibley family to recognize and remember Jack Sibley, the former director of postgraduate medical education here at McMaster. My name is Jonathan Sherboneau, and I am the Assistant Dean of Merit. If you don't know what Merit is, we'd invite you to discover a little bit more about us at merit.mcmaster.ca. Before we begin our plenary presentation, I think it's important, particularly in light of the, the topic and the conversation we're going to engage in, that we acknowledge the land from where I am speaking, although many of you will be in different um, territories and lands. Here at McMaster, we are on the territorial and traditional lands of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee. And as we think about the issue of anti-racism and anti-Indigenous uh, racism practices, I think we need to reflect and look backwards and acknowledge past practices and patterns that um, were not should not ever be considered or acted on, that we have a role to look forward and understand how we can acknowledge the roles that we've played um, in terms of our traditions and our past practices and how we can look to establish, mend and adopt new ways of interacting and engaging as members of an academic community, as members of society and how we engage personally. And so I am particularly delighted um, to welcome uh, Dr. Anderson, but to offer official uh, welcome and to introduce her, I would like to introduce Dr. Bernice Downey, who is the Associate Dean of Indigenous Health for the Faculty of Health Sciences. Dr. Downey. Ani, say go. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to welcome our colleague, Marsha Anderson. Marsha is Cree Anishinaabe and grew up in the north end of Winnipeg. Her family roots go to the Norway House Cree Nation and Peguis First Nation in Manitoba. She practices both internal medicine and public health as a medical officer of health with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority. She is the Vice Dean Indigenous Health and the Executive Director of Indigenous Academic Affairs in the Ungomazin Indigenous Institute of Health and Healing, RADI Faculty of Health Science at the University of Manitoba. She serves as the Chair of the Indigenous Health Network of the Association of Faculties of Medicine in Canada. She's a past president of the Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada and past chair of the Pacific Region Indigenous Doctors Congress. She was recognized for her contributions to Indigenous people's health with a National Aboriginal Achievement Award in March 2011. And in 2018, she was named one of the 100 most powerful women in Canada by the Women's Executive Network. We're very pleased to welcome you here, Marsha, to Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe Territory. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say about the important topic of medical education We've had, as you are aware, we've had a very robust exercise over the past couple of years, and uh, we've got lots of allies and champions, some who I see online today, to hear more about this important topic. And uh, we were able to connect with uh, Marsha and her team early in our process um, in the development of our own Indigenous Health Learning Lodge, which uh, is now underway in terms of implementation. And uh, so we're very much looking forward to future collaborations and uh, welcome once again, miigwech. Thanks Bernice. And uh, thank you for having me today. I am joining you from Treaty One territory, which is the territory of my ancestors and, and of my descendants. And I reflect regularly on being able to work uh, and to raise my children in the same spaces, uh, literally that my grandmother was raised in or that my great grandfather was raised in before the community was relocated to Peguis, or my great great grandfather was raised in, uh, knowing that he was about 10 or 11 at the signing of Treaty One. And when I think about locating myself by, you know, introducing myself in language with some of the names that I have been honored with, 
I always think also of my location in the continuum of time between generations um, and honoring the teachings and the sacrifices, the decisions uh, of my ancestors uh, and working the same way that they did for the health and joy and well-being of my descendants to come. This is a bit of where I am speaking from today. I was having a conversation with one of my friends the other day around how working um, in mainstream institutions, whether academic or government in my public health officer role or with the national organizations in my role as chair of the National Consortium for Indigenous Medical Education, quite often it feels like trying to hold the rock up hold the rock up of unjust, unfair, and equitable outcomes that are created through the forces of white supremacy and racism. And <clears throat> I would say I have felt that weight more acutely over this past year. Uh, and as we have seen actions in the time leading up to the pandemic and then throughout the pandemic, that have actually increased the steepness of that grade, have made that rock more heavily. And of course, it's not just COVID-19 and the inequitable effects of COVID-19 that we're seeing. It's the other fatal outcomes of systemic racism across systems as well, in particular racialized uh, police violence and the police shootings of Black and Indigenous people on both sides of our borders. Um, as well as the deaths due to systemic racism in healthcare that we have seen. And so my like brain processing, my ability to connect ideas and to respond to questions, I'll just acknowledge is not at the same level it is when that weight is, is less acute or is a bit less heavy than it is at times. This is uh, my friend Tasha. Tasha is a brilliant uh, Cree Trinidadian author. She became a new mom right at the start of this pandemic. Uh, and so she is raising a Black and Indigenous child within this context. And one of the things I've really relied on and appreciated is knowing that feeling I have, that weight that it feels like it's pressing down often on Indigenous peoples is not a weight or an experience that I'm having alone. Not all of us can relate to that, although many of us can. And for those who can, uh, I wanted to offer this piece of writing that Tasha did. And you can see it's, it's dated June 2020. And so some of the things that had happened or were happening around that time were the police shooting of 16-year-old Aisha Hudson in Winnipeg, of Breonna Taylor and of George Floyd. What she wrote was, do we have to set flame to a world that steals the breath from bodies that look like mine? that look like my child, so another more just world, one worthy of her, can rise from the ashes. If so, I say, let it fucking burn. And, you know, certainly I feel the, the weight and it's so helpful when others can put into words the emotions we have better than we can ourselves. But I also see in that reflected the tension of being a First Nations woman working in institutions and trying to balance the need to disrupt and dismantle the forces of racism um, with the concern that others may have that that process of disruption and dismantling will actually undermine the, the institution itself. And so I wanna talk more about that as we go along. So when I was preparing for this talk, and I've had a lot of a lot of opportunity to reflect um, on the course of my career and how we address racism in health professional education, but also over the past year in much more um, accelerated ways, what happens if we don't address systemic racism? And I was reflecting on the question, are we training the healthcare professionals that we need to provide healthcare that is free of racism? Are we training the healthcare professionals that we need to disrupt and dismantle systemic racism in healthcare and across systems in ways that impact the health of racialized individuals? And one point that I think is really critical to make is that 
even though I have seen and experienced and been part of conversations that have advanced around naming racism in healthcare, um, that we actually do not have evidence that we have made progress in addressing racism in healthcare. Uh, the chart on the left is a study from the US published in JAMA that looked at uh, pain control in emergency rooms uh, provided to white and non-white people. Uh, in an interesting mind trick, the white people are represented by the black dots and the non-white people are represented by the white dots. And, you know, two key takeaways from that diagram. And I'll, I'll just note for context, the massive report from the Institution of Medicine on racism in healthcare was published in between those two time periods. And there was some thesis in there that once we've identified racism in healthcare, and if we emphasize treatment according to guidelines, we will address racial healthcare gaps. So what this study showed was across multiple different types of pain, mild, moderate, severe, due to objectively painful conditions, including long bone fractures and uh, kidney stones, that non-white people systematically receive less pain control than white people. And that that difference was persistent across time periods, didn't really change. Pattern was essentially the same. On our side of the border, we have much less uh, data on healthcare quality by race uh, because of how we do or do not collect data and um, why we don't collect data by race, I think is a conversation for another day. Uh, but of course, I have also been reflecting, as many have since the death of Joyce Echaquan last year, on the death of Brian Sinclair in 2008, and how little actually had happened between those time periods to prevent how little has actually happened to prevent these tragic, egregious experiences of racism that lead to fatal outcomes for Indigenous people. And of course, recognizing that those are really tip of the iceberg experiences. Uh, and that um, each day there are many more experiences happening uh, by Black and Indigenous people. I also reflect on what medical education was like for me and how often I experienced racism in medical education and what Indigenous learners are experiencing now uh, and what I hear from Black learners as well about their often daily experiences of racism um, within their programs. And I think we have to be honest that when we ask that question, are we training the healthcare professionals that we need to provide healthcare that is free of racism? But the answer is no, we have not seen the significant shifts that we need to see. So then that led me to a couple of other questions. Uh, and, that, and those questions were, how does anti-racist change happen in organizations and in health professional education specifically. And the parallel question of that, of course, is how is racism or white supremacy being upheld currently uh, by health professional education? And then also what is the role of health professional education in disrupting and dismantling systemic racism, at least within education and healthcare? So let's assume for a moment that everyone agrees that health professional education should be explicitly anti-racist. So let's assume for at least a moment that that was actually a shared goal. This article by Kamara Jones, Black scholar in the US, former president of the American Public Health Association, um, provides some strategies and directions on how we apply the science to the practice of anti-racism. And her definition of racism I've included there, which is a system of assigning value and structuring opportunity based on the social interpretation of how one looks or what we call race. Now, the first step that she includes in the article is that we have to name racism. And some of the key features that I think we need to name is that it is pervasive. It is continuous across time. It operates at multiple levels, not just in the formal curriculum that we teach, uh, but throughout the structures of the organization as well. It is about the impacts of behaviors, of words, of policies, of actions, and not about people's current intentions. And importantly, racism exists because it serves a function, because it benefits some it upholds those ideas of white racial superiority 
and justifies advantaged access to power, money, and resources. So when you talk about assigning value and structuring opportunity based on the social interpretation of how one looks, we're not actually just talking about the system and the structures of disadvantage, but the corollary of that as well, which is that those structures advantage some. And people who are advantaged generally would prefer to stay advantaged. Now, I also think it's important that we acknowledge that this is not actually just about implicit bias, innocent bias, as some might prefer to uh, experience it or talk about it. It's not just about people being unkind or uncivil, and it's not just about a few bad apples. Now, in the next step, we might ask, how is racism operating here? And the here being health professional education. And a few things that I think we need to think about. Representation, certainly one. And representation amongst leadership, faculty, and staff. I think we have to understand, you know, where we are now and how that serves to uphold the status quo as opposed to challenge it. So this is a, a graph from some of Dr. Melinda Smith's work out at the U of A, a Black scholar I, I also admire quite a lot. Uh, and it is showing some of the race and gender identities of senior leaders across the U15. Uh, and certainly it's pretty obvious that most positions uh, are made up of white men and white women. It is somewhat problematic to lump all visible minorities into one category uh, because of the uh, diversity of experiences. And if we had uh, Black men and women pulled out, the numbers would be very small as well. Of course, being an Indigenous woman, I'm always interested in that yellow box, but I have yet to be able to pick out the yellow line across those very senior level positions. We think about that saying in leadership around tone from the top, uh, we can see that we don't have the representative leadership that we would need uh, to address systemic racism in health professional education or education in general. Now, one thing that some people will be considering is is that about racism or is that about merit? Is this a reflection of the people who have the qualifications and we actually have the best qualified people um, in each of these positions? And I certainly wouldn't say anything about the academic qualifications of any of these people, but I do think we need to reimagine for the outcomes that we need now from our educational institutions if we have actually valued the right qualifications and if there are maybe some qualifications that we have undervalued. And I think we have seen repeatedly when we consider recommendations that have come out even from public health or different communities uh, in public health during COVID-19, that a lack of representation really does equate to a lack of the relevant expertise to address racism and to work towards health equity. Now, Another way that racism operates within health professional education um, certainly has to do with the front end of this pipeline as well, which is who gets admitted into health professional education. Uh, again, I have been participating in discussions around medical school admissions uh, since the early 2000s. Uh, and there continues to be this tension between we need to use evidence-based tools uh, that can screen out from the large number of applicants that we receive that far exceed the number of seats available, who are the most qualified or the most competitive. And what we end up with almost universally across the country is some matrix of scoring based on a series of tools that have all been shown to be racially biased. Some more racially biased, but some less racially biased. Uh, but all racially biased. And again, I think that this really leads us to need to question if this is purely about qualifications and, and competitiveness and a true meritocracy, or if we're stacking the deck in favor of some individuals and disadvantaging others. Because if we are only using tools in that screening process and the admissions process that systematically advantage white people, and systematically disadvantaged uh, racialized individuals, 
I think it's hard to say uh, that we are, uh, we have a meritocracy and that we are admitting the quote unquote best and brightest. And I think there are concrete ways that we might actually be able to shift that. Let's say we were a fan of the Casper tool or the MMI and we wanted to continue to use that. What if we only used stations that were developed by Black and Indigenous people, for example, and that were the grading rubrics and grading were actually only done by Black and Indigenous people? How might that respond more to the needs of Black and Indigenous people as we try to address systemic racism in healthcare? Of course, there's much more that could be done, but I just offer that one situation. Racism operates in the case-based learning and clinical scenarios that we use. One of the most common complaints that I receive has to do with case-based scenarios that uh, really draw exclusively on stereotypes. Almost never is the case scenario of the healthy pregnant woman a Black or Indigenous person. Almost always is the case that involves alcoholism, an Indigenous person. And those are patterns that I hear about across the country. Uh, and certainly I think we could do a lot more in how we position uh, Indigenous people and actively work to counter those stereotypes instead of further entrenching them. And then of course is the challenge of the clinical learning environments. So even if we have the best formal Indigenous health curriculum that is rooted in anti-racism, anti-colonialism, and cultural safety, in the first two years of, let's say, undergraduate medical learning, that gets quickly undone in the clinical years if what they see role modeled is routine um, racism within healthcare, whether that is differences in um, how quickly tests are ordered and done, whether that is differences in who gets referred for angiogram within 24 hours uh, and who doesn't, whether that's differences in uh, what pain control individuals get and whose chest pain or uh, symptoms are attributed to alcohol versus a full workup done. These are all things that we hear over and over and over. Those patterns of healthcare get entrenched very quickly into how our new practitioners also will practice. And then the last point that I'll just mention, understanding that racism operates in many ways within our organizations is the absence of accountability. The thing that is the easiest to do almost is to make an anti-racist statement of some kind, even to pass a policy. The thing that is the hardest is to actually hold people accountable to it in ways that are visible and transparent so that people can see there's meaningful accountability when racist actions occur. And then the third aspect that she talks about is organizing and strategizing to act. This is, um, a quote I really like uh, is from a book that I read while I was taking my um, executive coaching certification at Royal Roads. Um, part of the reason I took an executive coaching course was really to deepen my own understanding of leadership and how organizations function. I think it's uh, when we think about organizational change and systems theory, we always have to be thinking about both systems at once, right? the systems of racism and white supremacy that are functioning that we are trying to bring anti-racist change to, as well as you know, the health professional education system or the healthcare system. Uh, and so understanding more about organizations and how organizations operate and how change management occurs uh, is something I've been very interested in and bridging that uh, with that anti-racist, anti-colonial approach. So this quote says, change alters power relationships and undermines existing agreements and pacts. Even more profoundly, it intrudes on deeply rooted symbolic forms, traditional ways, icons, and rituals. Below the surface, an organization's cultural tapestry begins to unravel, threatening time-honored traditions, prevailing cultural values and ways, and shared meanings. Shared meaning. And you know, I read this quote, and when I think about anti-racism, 
and serving Black and Indigenous communities in ways that fulfill their health and healthcare rights, it excites me actually. This kind of disruption that's described, described here, I find exciting and hopeful. But if we were in person or I had any visual cues, what would have happened as I was discussing this and reading this out is not a not insignificant proportion of the usual audience I speak to would have visibly reacted in some way. There would have been stiffening, shuffling, some people would have made eye contact with a peer they know is like-minded. Some people may have rolled their eyes. Um, and this would have started when I started talking about representation and admissions in ways that challenged our ideas of the meritocracy. It wouldn't have been because explicitly they believe these things are a function of racism and white supremacy and should be upheld, but because of the deep belief that occurs in the symbolic forms, traditional ways, icons, rituals, the time-honored traditions. We have to do it this way because we've always done it that way and we can't imagine doing it a different way because of the shared meaning that's held, because of those existing agreements and pacts that sometimes are formal, uh, such as in collective agreements and are sometimes informal. The people who have this tacit permission that you can call this senior leader or that senior leader to raise your concern. You can have that backroom conversation or wherever that might occur. That level of advantaged access is getting disrupted when we talk about change in this way. So the one thing I would say is that it is naive and actually dangerous to incorrectly assume that anti-racism is a shared goal. There's a, another Black author in the US named Ibram Kendi who wrote this book called Stamp from the Beginning, which is a history of racism in the Americas. And one of the things he says in it is, I saw two distinct historical forces. I saw a dual and dueling history of racial progress and the simultaneous progression of racism. I saw the anti-racist force of equality and the racist force of inequality marching forward, progressing in rhetoric, in tactics, and in policies. So I think over the last few years, we have pretty undeniably seen the rise of racism in rhetoric and tactics and in policies. We used to talk about the war on drugs. That was something that Donald Trump doubled down on during his tenure as president at the United Nations. And that interestingly, uh, within a week of when I was invited to our federal government's uh, anti-racism strategy discussion that Justin Trudeau had agreed to support this doubling down on the war on drugs. Um, a war on drugs that is widely recognized as not just a failed public health intervention, uh, but the key driving force behind the mass incarceration of black and brown people, uh, again on both sides of the border. I think about the evolution of racism in First Nations education as another example of this, um, how we've gone from you know, the residential school era, taking children, explicit assimilation agenda, the 60s scoop, you know, the mass apprehension of indigenous kids and child welfare, and we have the chronic underfunding of First Nations education. I think that is another example of how racism evolves over time. Sometimes we conceptualize racism as this fixed bar, that if we just do this and we just get over that, then we'll be on the other side and it'll be all good. And that doesn't happen. It continues to evolve in its rhetoric, its tactic and its policies at the same time that we evolve in our anti-racist forces for equity and for justice. And the reason that it continues to evolve, as I've mentioned previously, is that it becomes because it serves some people. It serves people who are currently benefiting from the existing agreements and pacts, who time-honored tradi traditions, prevailing cultural values and ways and shared meanings are embedded in our institutions and consider including our health professional education institutions and who don't want to see um, that balance shift. And so within our organizations, we certainly have people on both sides of that. People who are in pursuit of that anti-racist change, 
and people who believe we need to continue to maintain the status quo. And so this is like a little diagram I've been playing with around an anti-racist change model, trying to bring some of these different ideas together, um, not just for talks like this, but because it actually helps me strategize around how we work, how do we take that next step? How do we get to the point actually where the next generation of Indigenous learners in health professional education are not experiencing racism on a daily basis? So those little cycles, learning, conviction, determination, action, and effort, I actually read that the other day on the weekend um, in the Dalai Lama's book, The Art of Happiness. And he was talking about that as a model for change um, and how we go through those phases. And I'm sure each of us can think of different change models that are aligned with those ideas. When it comes to anti-racist change, because racism is about impacts, we really need to be getting to the action and effort phases of that change model in order to shift the balance, right? People learning about anti-racism, people developing some conviction, those are important steps, but that is not the, the step that actually creates the impact and the change. We need to get people into action and effort, right? And we need to recognize that at the same time we're doing that, that's happening on the side of the status quo. That is what's leading to that evolution in racism and rhetoric and tactics and in policies. And so in a really simplistic way, we are actually talking about getting more people on the anti-racist change side of the lever there, right? But we also have to recognize the many different levels that those people need to be working at in order to get to the type of organizational cultural change we need to see to actually have measurable impacts on our learners and on the patients that we serve. I think what's really important is to recognize that in this lever, that's a very fine point. It's very easy to shift the balance and we can't expect that that's going to become fixed. We should always expect that a counterforce is going to be applied that counterforce can be either passive or active. Um, the unfortunate thing about this is that the passive forces always maintain the status quo and do not lead to anti-racist change. And that's why we need to get more people into that action and effort step. So this is, you know, a pretty common health leadership framework. People probably are familiar with it. I do think it's useful when we're talking about anti-racist change as well to learn what we can from this, uh, recognizing that the framework itself is limited in its explicit consideration of race and racism. And so we need to uh, talk more um, and critically reflect more on how it can be applied to this work. Now, one of the first steps that we often take, and it's an important step, is of course the step of education, right? And we might think about that in terms of what we're teaching at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. Might think about that in continuing professional development, certainly in faculty development, had a good chat with Teresa earlier about what some of the opportunities might be um, in that faculty development approach. For the most part, this is educational approach is around building learning and conviction. Hopefully it moves people towards action, but that is generally what we do. And that's why the education is necessary, but not sufficient, right? We've seen a lot of checklist approaches where people say, well, I had this learning event, had that learning event. So we're kind of done with this for now. I think there's a growing understanding that that is um, necessary, but not sufficient. And we need to do more to move people from conviction through determination and into action. And uh, what I would theorize is that that piece of it, that piece of moving from conviction to action predominantly happens through the relationship-based domains um, within this LEADS framework, right? Where we're engaging with others, we're developing coalitions. Um, I think it's important, it's really hard to do this when you're the only one, you're the single person. That's why we've often talked about the needs for cohort-based hiring, 
building centers or units so we don't have you know for example a single black person leading all of anti-racism i say that right now because that's essentially where we're at and we need to build more supports around that if we want it to be effective and if we want the person in the position uh to be able to be healthy uh and maybe even have some enjoyment of the work. It's absolutely necessary to build more of a core team approach and then look at how we expand that outward. Within that though, and maybe this is a bit more of the strategic process side of relationship is looking at how we develop positions and influence on key decision-making communities. And I think this is what starts to bridge us from the relationship-based process into the systems transformation as well. And so we might think about, for example, admissions committees, progress committees, curriculum committees, all very important. Um, search committees, hiring committees, particularly for senior leadership positions, I think also critical uh, in terms of having influence and seeing how commitment and skill and anti-racism is being evaluated when we are selecting our senior leaders of the team. Again, thinking about how that creates the tone from the top. Now, in that developing coalition piece, another note that I would have when I think about how we've been able to do this over time, and I'm gonna provide some examples right away around how we've seen this, is the, the need to actually deliver on some actions, right? So we have been in this constant cycle of proposing, thing, proposing things to the deans around indigenous health or anti-racism, accessing some resources, and then being able to deliver on the results. And each time we do that, you know, we ask for more resources, we build the expectations, we make sure we deliver on them. And that cycle actually really helps to build influence and trust within health professional education. And when we combine those with access to power through representation on committees, that has been how we've been able to start to tackle structures how we have been able to move from getting people on board and building coalitions into changing the actual structures of the university. That includes our Senate approved Institute in Indigenous Health. Uh, it includes the way we've been able to shift admissions policies and certainly does include uh, the ability to finally pass an anti-racism policy that is faculty wide. Uh, last year. That policy, I'll just note, uh, was over 10 years in the making. Uh, took quite a long time to have the need for a specific anti-racism policy accepted, uh, to develop the policy itself, and then to put the work so that it got passed by the multiple levels of committees that it needed to get passed by. We're now in a phase uh, and you know, we'll acknowledge that this phase has been slowed down of building the strategy and the implementation that supports the kind of aspirational ideals that are embedded in the policy. And one of the key things, or a couple of the key things around that would be looking at for consistency across all uh, faculty policies. Uh, and what we've embedded in that is a need for racial equity impact assessments of some kind. Uh, so that when new policies are being passed or policies are up for renewal and reconsideration that explicitly their impacts on uh, racism and that anti-racism lens is applied. A second piece of this, and this goes back to uh, the development of our TRC action plans after the release of the uh, final report of the TRC was that when we identified at that time the need for a specific anti-racism policy within the faculty, we also identified the need for that to be parallel in the clinical learning environment. And so that is now happening at Shared Health. We certainly have some work to do on integrating that and ensuring it's aligned. Uh, and of course that means mobilizing and navigating this within a very different governing system, right? So, as opposed to our faculty governance structure, um, 
we will be moving through a government appointed board governing structure um, within our current government context. So building on what has learned and worked for us there to try to support that in the parallel clinical learning environment. And, you know, we are very early on in accountability. We actually have done a racial climate survey, got a lot of very racist comments in the open text fields that uh, haven't totally decided on how to address or respond yet. That's something we'll be doing over time. We've been training uh, additional Black and Indigenous people to participate in investigations when complaints about racism are made. And we'll be looking at how we transparently report in ways that meet the collective agreement requirements around privacy and confidentiality for employees, how we report on the outcomes investigations such that we start to tip the balance so people actually think that reporting results in outcomes that are worth the risks of reporting. So this slide is actually from a whole um, different lecture, but these are some features that we that I've discussed in other settings of Indigenous leadership. And I just wanted to spend the last few minutes before we go to questions, talking about how the work that we've done in the academic environment has contributed to our COVID response in ways that I think really enshrine the excellence of, and I'm gonna talk specifically about First Nations leadership and our First Nations COVID response since that has been my focus. Um, the, the statement there that talks about Indigenous leadership as location. What's been uh, the biggest blessing of the COVID response uh, and my role in it has been having this really unique position of having a government recognized mandate as a medical officer of health with authority under the Public Health Act having an academic mandate that exists through the Ongamazin Institute, uh, because we do deliver clinical services uh, to many First Nations communities in Manitoba. And then also having an explicit community mandate to provide leadership to the First Nations pandemic response. And that community mandate came through the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs as a resolution for myself and my colleague Mel to lead the Manitoba First Nations pandemic response coordination team. And bridging all of those mandates, as well as leveraging all of the relationships um, and holding the different organizations accountable to their mandated responsibilities has resulted in some of the um, best regarded aspects of Manitoba's pandemic response. So if we think about First Nations leadership as rights-based, the example that I'll give in the response is around our data sovereignty. So very early on, we developed an information sharing agreement between First Nations Health and Social Services of Manitoba and Manitoba Health, which holds the public health information management system where all of the COVID case investigations are stored. With that information sharing agreement, we have both access to the Indian registry through the status verification system, as well as to self-identification data on case investigation forms. And this has given us the best First Nations specific COVID-19 information in the country. It includes both status and non-status First Nations people, which is unique, and it includes both on and off reserve experience. And we have used this information to leverage responses. And the example that I'll give of that is our vaccine rollout. We, um, with the information that we have, we have the allocation to have been proceeding very quickly with a First Nations community rollout. Uh, we have currently delivered um, vaccine to all 63 First Nations community to offer it to their 18 plus population because our data is showing higher breakthrough infection rates than in the general population. We also um, have successfully advocated to roll straight into second doses as soon as we finish First Nations doses on reserve, um, instead of waiting the up to four months for all other Manitobans to be vaccinated. And for officer First Nations, we use the data that we had that shows higher case hospitalization rates, higher ICU admission rates, um, and at much younger ages to advocate for a 20 year differential. So that when they started doing the 
um, general population age-based rollout at age 80, for example, First Nations people age 60 and over uh, were eligible. And that, um, that differential has continued as they've continued to lower the general population uh, age rollout. And when we think about it as effective and necessary, we saw very early on that there was going to be gaps in surge support available. So when we thought about how um, the necess necessity of the test trace isolate cycle, we knew that in First Nations communities, access to testing and sufficient people to actually do the test was going to be a barrier, uh, as was access to case and contact management. And so we developed the idea of the rapid response teams, which have now been deployed well over 75 times to First Nations communities to help with uh, help with outbreak or cluster control. We have been able to deploy um, rapid testing devices with our teams throughout. And this has been a, a key component of containing and minimizing the disproportionate impacts that we have seen. Now, everybody on our rapid response team has a substantive position somewhere else. They all uh, have volunteered to do this work. They get paid for it, but they volunteer to do this work in addition and over and above their regular job. This is also true for our search support for the vaccine rollout, which we also coordinate on behalf of First Nations in the province. Between the two lists, when we put the call out for people to volunteer to be on the rapid response teams and on our search support lists, we had well over 400 people sign up for one or both of those teams. And what that spoke to was us, uh, to us was how much people wanted to be part of the solution. We saw in real time and in very concrete ways how our investment in building relationships, in education, in moving people to that action and effort have benefited our communities. And we see how that can be translated into other aspects of both the healthcare system and the health professional education system. So I am going to end there and I would be happy to take a few questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anderson, for uh, a, a really inspiring, but also a challenging presentation to us. Um, if you are willing to ask a question, you can do so in the chat. You can also come off mute and pose it. I'm using the raise hand function, and I'll try to facilitate that. One of the questions that I thought of as you were speaking is, there were lots of opportunities and explicit um, next steps for those in senior leadership, particularly in health professions education, about ways to develop processes and practices to improve this equity gap that we see. I wonder for frontline teachers or for health profession students, what are those acts of disruption or acts of allyship that you would encourage us to, to put into practice in the coming weeks? so that we move not just from a, a powerful message, but we move to action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I think a few of the things that people could start doing quickly, and it's one actually, it's the same call to action that I gave to CPHA last week, was to immediately review representation on committees. Um, I really see over and over again how that lack of representation is translating into lack of relevant expertise and is slowing down progress. Um, at the same time, I think uh, we have to be aware that we're not putting people in isolated positions where it's one against the many and trying to challenge the status quo. So when we think about representation and relevant expertise, we might be thinking about multiple systems of oppression um, and how we cohort so that we don't have an unreasonable power balance stacked against people. I was also impressed by um, an insight that you shared during one of the small group sessions that we had in advance of the plenary session. I was wondering if maybe you could reiterate the idea. And it was in the context of how do we build collaborators for projects that we want to, to um, 
engage with First Nations people. And your comment really was, is that you don't pull people into your culture. You need to move into their culture and build those relationships first before making requests. Maybe you could expand and, and um, probably correct some of them, the, the misunderstandings I might've had, but I thought it was really a powerful way of reframing that idea of connectedness and collaboration. Sure, thank you. Um, so that came from a model I've developed with Ganiganichik, which is an urban indigenous organization in Winnipeg that's looking at how we improve the cultural safety of primary care services, providing sexual health services to indigenous peoples. But the principles I think um, would, would, up, would hold up in many different settings. And the one that uh, we're discussing here is the idea of community participation. And very often when we talk about community participation, we are talking about the ways that we can bring community into the structures that we want in the ways that we want, whether that is for the purposes of research or participating as standardized patients or participating on an interview panel. And our first outreach to them is to try to get them to bring in. And the way that we frame community participation within that model is actually how do I as an individual participate in the community that I'm supposed to be serving? How do we as an organization participate in the communities that we're supposed to be serving in ways that are meaningful and relevant to them? And so when I, uh, some of the examples I gave was when I came back and I started uh, working in Winnipeg as an MOH, spent a lot of time building my urban indigenous relationships that went beyond my history of growing and raising up here because of family, uh, specific family experiences. So it involved showing up at community events, including powwows, feasts, ceremonies, protests, uh, things I was interested in anyways, but it was really important for community to see me out there, both as an individual and also bringing people from my organizations. So building relationships out um, in ways that are you know, mutually respected and valued before making an ask for people to come in uh, was how we have framed community participation there. Uh, Dr. Chan. Hi, thank you so much for a great presentation. Um, I had a question more around, um, like in terms of building capacity within our system uh, to be able to be more welcoming to people to, um, to be more inclusive. Um, what are like some of the early steps that you've taken in your work to create more inclusive spaces? Mm -hmm. Especially now in the digital world, because I think that that's an especially extra, extra <laughs> step we have to go to. Yeah, and on that note, I would just say this past year has been really uh, challenging for that, has been really difficult. And I wouldn't say, I wouldn't even say inclusive. I would say the spaces have not always actually been safe. Um, like there has been some quite explicit racism. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'll just leave it there. So I, I do think it is extra challenging at times in the digital, digital environment. And I think about uh, going into a meeting room and part of what I you know, go through, and I'll also recognize like at this point, I'm pretty senior academically, I'm like a pretty good national profile when it comes to this kind of work. Uh, so my position in the room is difficult than somebody who's maybe a junior academic just starting out or even a learner uh, who is having to lead some of the work because of the lack of representation amongst faculty and staff, right? Um, so I think one of the most important things I would say is recognizing that anti-racism is everybody's responsibility. And when we think about what makes an environment unsafe, one of the key things is the unchecked racism, um, including the unchecked casual racism, the non-reflective statements that are more aligned with meritocracy that don't actually challenge who has had the opportunity to build and meet what we consider merit or qualifications that make us competitive and who doesn't, um, or doesn't consider, like I said, who is considered the norm and who is kind of almost passively or tacitly left out of that then. That makes environments unsafe for people to be a part of. Um, and it is a real tension to have to take on 
uh, for my, in my case as a visibly First Nations person, have to take on and accept that I will be in unsafe environments to try to work and change the environments for the future. But one of the things that makes it safer is if I'm not the only one trying to make the environment safer, right? Which means I'm not the only one checking those statements, for example, when they occur, but other people are marking things as inappropriate or asking questions that lead to a diff different level of analysis. I think those moments when, um, whether the statement is said directly about the community that you're part of or not, when you react in a way that marks it as, as inappropriate is a time when someone like me can be like, okay, that's someone I should talk to after the meeting, or I'm not totally alone here. That starts to build trust and starts to make the place safer. Um, as we pursue this change. So just one, one example there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anderson. We're coming up on our time and we're gonna transition in a very brief moment to the Sibley Award presentation. But I do wanna give you an opportunity for any final comments and to have that last word. So there is one question in the chat that I'll just quickly respond to there. So what would be my recommendation for starting to address racism and creating policies within departments? Is it through members of the division or through an external expert committee? Uh, so my reflection on this would be, there's not one right way to get started and I would leverage as many possible ways as possible. So I have participated in external expert committees. Uh, for example, the NOSM external review that I participated in was very public and it's uh, online. People can exist within that. But when it comes to the work of actually getting the policies passed and then implemented the strength of of putting that work in internally is the investment you have already made in building the relationships and the coalitions and getting more people on side. It's very hard to actually lead the change work from an external position. Thank you so much. Um, for those of you who have been as impacted by your words, Dr. Sanderson, we will have a a final polished version of this presentation up on the Merit YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And so you'll be able to share and distribute those with other colleagues and, and friends that you think would benefit from uh, being hearing from you and being part of this conversation.